feet and daylight unto my path. Unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and daylight unto a light unto my path. Welcome to Searchlight, a survey through Scripture with Pastor John Corson. It is our desire to bring you a systematic study of the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, book by book. The key is, listen, the key is when you fall down, pick something up, learn a lesson, and then keep on going. Abraham You see, here he is. He's on the way again, and he's moving. And he's on his way now where he should have been going 25 years previously. He's on his way to the promised land. So he goes now. He's on his way, and here he is. He passes through, verse 6, the land under the place of Sychem. For you Bible students, that's Sychar in the New Testament, the John 4 story, Jesus talking to the woman at the well. That's this spot, you see. He passes through that place under the plain of Moray, and the Canaanite was then in the land. The Canaanite, those people that were cursed and condemned, those people that were carnal, beyond belief, sinful and iniquitous, God says, I'm going to give you that land, Abraham. I'm going to give you that land. So the Canaanites were to be exterminated because they were a very wicked, perverted, sinful people. And they were to be wiped out, put out of their misery, and to keep the contamination from spreading any further, you see. It's an act of mercy and love. Be that as it may, at this point, the Canaanite was in the land, and Abraham... Uh, Heard from the Lord, verse 7, the Lord appeared to him and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. Mark that, because when you hear discussions, as you do, about whose land is it, that is, the West Bank, the Gaza, the Golan Heights, Israel, and beyond, actually, arguing over whose land is it, God says, It's my land, and I am giving the land to you, Abram. I'm giving the land to you and to your seed. What seed? Later on, he says, I'm giving the land to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the Jewish nation. Folks, the whole geopolitical problem is so simple if you read your Bible. God says, I am giving that land to the Jew. That's whose land it is, very simply. And I tell you, that's the way it's going to be, ultimately. So Abram, what does he do? There, verse 7, he builds an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence, verse 8, unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord and Abram journeyed going on toward the south. He's in the promised land. What does he do? Just like when we went to the moon, what did we do? We planted a flag. When the Americans landed on the moon, they planted a flag. And we put a plaque at the base of that flag saying, we come in peace. We left a marker. So Abram, going into the promised land, leaves a marker. Now listen carefully. Over and over again, Abram, or Abraham, wherever he goes, he will do these two things. He will build an altar, which shows he's a worshiper. And he will pitch his tent, which shows that he's a pilgrim. He never builds a house. Why? Because in Hebrews chapter 11, I'll read it to you. Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Abram, when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive afterwards for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out not knowing where he was going. Can you relate to that? Hebrews 11, 8, Abram went, not knowing where he was going. Okay, Lord, here we go. And off he goes. And it says this, By faith he sojourned as a stranger in the country. 
country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. For, verse 10, he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abram, he lives in tents. Why? He already did the big house and hot tub and Lexus thing. He already had the Rolex and all the rest. Did that. 50 years he did that. You know what he found out? He figured out when he was 50, this is not where it's at. What does he say? I'm looking for a city that has foundations. Not like Ur of the Chaldees. What I'm really craving for is heaven. I'm a stranger here. I'm a pilgrim here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to live in a tent. That's the way we're to live. Are you saying we should sell our houses and live in tents? Not necessarily. But what I am saying is, is that Abram, the father of faith, also called the friend of God, shows us the real way to live. Wherever you go, worship. It'll alter your life. You build the altar of worship, it will alter who you are, how you feel, the way you think. It'll alter you. And wherever you go, have a tent mentality. Oh, you might live in a great big house. Fine, but don't take it seriously. You see, you're looking for a city that has foundations. You may think, I may think, what I'm really looking for is a house in the country. Or a house on the lake. Or a new addition. Or business growth. Or a dream house. Or a dream car. Or a dream boat. Some guy some girl, whatever it might be. Uh Uh-uh. What you're really craving, what I'm really craving is a thing called heaven, a city that has foundations. No other city has foundations. It's shaky. It's wobbly. It's a mirage. If you think, I'm going to be happy just as soon as we add on the extra room, you're kidding yourself. You're deluded. I'm going to be happy just as soon as he gives me the raise. You're kidding yourself. I'm going to be happy just as soon as the divorce goes through. And I get to run off with her or him or whoever it may be. Hey, you're deceived. I'm deceived. Because what we're really craving is a thing called heaven. Abram says, I'm 50. I've got it figured out. What I'm really looking for is a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Therefore, I'm not going to take this world all that seriously. I'm going to live in a tent. And whether you live in a big house, that's great, but don't take it seriously. Or a small house, that can be very freeing, actually. Or no house, you're in good company. Fact of the matter is, you live for heaven. When you're living for heaven... You take a whole lot more things a whole lot less seriously. And you can enjoy life, truly enjoy it. But if you're living for this life, you're going to be disappointed and disillusioned in it. So what does Abram do? He's a model for me and you. Wherever he goes, he builds an altar. He pitches a tent. He's a worshiper and he's a stranger or a pilgrim who's looking for a city that has foundations. One more thing in this passage that intrigues me. It says he pitched his tent Having Bethel on the west, the name Bethel means house of God. And Hai on the east. The word Bethel means house of God. Guess what Hai means? It means the heap. It means the dump, literally. The heap or the dump. So he has the house of God ahead of him. He has the dump on the other side of him. And that's basically where you and I live. We're going to the house of God. In my father's house are many dwelling places. We know where we're going. And we've left the dump of this world. We know what the world's about, don't we? And we're kind of in this middle ground right now. We got heaven before us. We got the dump behind us. And like Abram, we're just kind of camped out in the middle, waiting for the culmination that is heaven, 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 heaven. That's where he's camped. That's what he's doing. Now, he goes south. But then, oh, quickly, watch this. Ah, sad to say, he's walking now, but he's going to falter once again. Oh, boy. There was a famine in the land. Abram went down into Egypt. Whenever you read about Egypt, now you'll see that phrase. You go down to Egypt. You always go up to Jerusalem. You always go down to Egypt in the scriptures. Because Egypt is a type of or a symbol of what? The world. 
What's Abram doing? He was doing so good right now for a while, but now he boom, falls again because there's a famine. Got to do something. There's no food here. God said, go to the land that I will show thee of. Abram went there, but he didn't stay there. Now he says, I've got to do something. Listen, it's always dangerous when you're in that space when you think you've got to do something. Because you're going to end up, in many cases, we're going to end up much of the time like chickens with our heads cut off, running around. But all it means is we've been separated from the head, Jesus Christ. We're, and here he's running. He's going down to Egypt to try and get food, you see. came to pass when he was come near, verse 11, to enter into Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, now, I know that thou art a fair woman, or a snap eye, a babe. You're, you're, you're really, I mean, she was still young. She was only at this time 65 years of age. And he says, man, you are a real beaut. You're a babe. Oh, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, this is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. They'll kill me to get you. Oh, you're such a beauty, Sarah A.I. So he says, verse 13, say, I pray thee, that thou art my, my sister, that it may be well for me uh, for thy sake, and my soul shall live. Because Just, just tell them that you're my sister. And that way I won't die. Here's the man of faith. He's faltering in the area of faith because you always struggle, stumble in the area that you're normally the strongest in. Peter was bold, taking out his sword, ready to take on a whole army to defend Jesus in Gethsemane. But then he falters in that same area when a little girl at the fire says, aren't you one of his? Blankety, blank, blank. He says, I don't know him. Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. How do we know? He tells us. He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And yet, what did he do? (laughs) Moses, what happened with him? He fell when? You rebels, he said, must we fetch water for you? As he smashes his rod against the rock, a total lack of meekness. Noah was a righteous man. What happened to him? He got drunk and naked. The area that you're strongest in is the area that you'll be most vulnerable to fall because you'll depend usually, rely usually on your own strength. Where you think, hey, that's not going to be a problem. I'm never going to do that. Watch out. I'll never fall there. Watch out. Because that's the area where you're probably going to experience failure because you'll be depending upon your own ability. Where you know you're weak, you rely on God, you see. So what happens here is this guy, Abram, He's a man of faith, but he goes, oh, 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 just just say that you're my sister, which was partially true. You follow the genealogies through, and you see that Abram and Sarah A.I., or Sarah, were actually half-brother, half-sister. But a half a truth is a total lie. You see, understand this. Please take note of this. When the Bible says, do not bear false witness, what is false witness? It defines at one place, Matthew 26 the trial of Jesus, they got false witnesses who said, he said, Jesus, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. Well, he did say that. Then why are they called false witnesses? Because although he said those words, they were saying the right information with the wrong implication. They were saying, he's going to tear down the temple. Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. Listen, false witness, as defined in the Bible, isn't just a great big whopper. It's when you're tricky and you're clever. And you're telling a half-truth or three-quarters of a truth, or you're saying an exact quote. It's the right information, but the wrong implication. It's a real tricky deal. Say that you're my sister, which is technically true, but not really. She's really his wife, you see. And so be careful of the tendency. If any of you are clever with words, watch out. If you're tricky, repent. Because a false witness is one who is able to say things that are technically true or even exactingly quoted, but wrong implication. False witness as identified in Matthew chapter 26 at the trial of Jesus. Thou shalt not bear false witness. God thunders on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and false witnesses are seen at the trial of Jesus with wrong implication. Dangerous, dangerous thing. Say, you're my sister. 
Technically sort of true, I guess. And, and, and it all do okay. Well, it came to pass. When Abram was come to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. And when the Bible says a gal is very fair, that means she is very fair. Well, the princes of Pharaoh saw her, verse 15, and commended her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. And he, Pharaoh, verse 16, entreated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, he asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. Pharaoh said, so that's your sister, eh? Take all this stuff. Take these servants, men servants, and maid servants, and camels, and oxes, and asses, which in those days, that was the rich stuff. Those were the Rolexes, you know. It was the fancy stuff, you see. Take this stuff, and, and, and I'll take your sister. So Abram gets all this stuff, but... The Lord, verse 17, plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Sarah, Abram's wife. Pharaoh that night thinks, oh, I'm in the mood for love, and suddenly he finds himself staggering. No doubt he intended to be with her, but suddenly he's just perhaps barfing, he's staggering, he's just not in the mood for anything, but just laying in his bed, he's sick. Not only is he sick, but all of the guys around him are sick too. They're plagued. They're unable to follow through. Pharaoh cannot do what he intended to do. And somehow he understands the reason. And Pharaoh called Abram, verse 18, and said, What is this that thou hast done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was thy wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore... Take thy wife and go thy way. And Pharaoh commended his men concerning him, or commanded, pardon me, his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife. Notice this last phrase, and all that he had. Listen carefully. Don't miss this. Sarah, the wife of Abram, is the one woman whom the Bible holds up as a picture of what a Christian wife should be. Abram was blowing it here. He was leading his wife in a way that was not the best, down into Egypt. And then he chickened out and left his wife in a vulnerable spot where she was taken into Pharaoh's Pharaoh's harem. But listen to what the Bible has to say in 1 Peter chapter 3. And if you don't know this passage, jot it down. Please read it. Wives, be in submission to your own husbands that they may behold your chaste lifestyle. He says, as he talks about the inner character of a beautiful woman who is submitted to her husband, who is serving and seeking her God. Then he says this, For in after this manner, verse 5, women, holy women of old time, trusted in God and adorned themselves by being in submission to, to their own husbands. Peter says, this is the key. Wives, you submit to your husband. It's what is precious in the sight of God. Even as Sarah, verse 6, Sarah, the gal we're talking about, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Whose daughters are you, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement, simply said, Sarah called her husband Abram Lord. She reverenced him. She was in submission to him. But but he's leading her astray. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. What the Lord here is saying in this story and in the text of 1 Peter chapter 3, Sarah is the model of the way it's supposed to be. You're to be in submission to your husband because you are ultimately trusting in the Lord to do what? Look what the Lord did in this story. Sarah honored her husband, calling him master or Lord. Honored him in being submitted even when he was not walking in wisdom. And God, number one, protected her. You submit to your husband. And even if he's going in a less than the best way, Listen, wifey, listen, sister, listen, lady. He will protect you like he protected Sarah that day. 
He will protect you. Now, I'm not talking about being a doormat. I'm not talking about not giving your input. I'm not talking about a lack of animated interaction and discussion. But when the time comes where a decision must be made, and if you and your hubby don't agree, when the decision must be made, even if you think it's not the best way, wife, you are to be in submission to him. Because you see, that is a sacrifice that you're giving to the Lord. Sacrifice isn't sacrifice unless it's sacrifice. It means nothing to be in submission if you agree with hubby. Where submission kicks in is when you don't really agree with him. When sacrifice is really given is when it costs you something. When you say, I don't know if this is the best way or if this is the highest route, but okay, I'm going to submit to you because, Lord, you tell me that that's what is supposed to happen in marriage, you see. God protected her, and God, number two, prospered the family. Because she was a submitted wife, God prospered the family. How so? Look what happened here. Look in our story. They got oxes and sheep and donkeys and servants and camels. They became wealthy again. Because Pharaoh said, hey, take this stuff. And when Pharaoh said, what did you do? Get out of here. It says that they took all that they had, verse 20. All the stuff that was given. You want to enrich your family? Wife, sister, dear lady. If you want to enrich your family, here's what you do. Be in subjection, in submission to your husband. God will bless your family richly in ways that will blow your mind. Well, you say, that sounds awfully chauvinistic to me. Well, you say, Abram comes out smelling like a rose. I mean, can you believe this guy? I mean, he puts his wife in a place of vulnerability, of danger, so he can save his own skin and make it easier for himself. And then he walks away with all kinds of riches. You say, Oh, man, that sounds chauvinistic to me. Wait a minute. That's not the end of the story. Abram doesn't get off scot-free, folks. You see, one of the things listed here in our story that he got was maid servants. One of the servants, one of the maid servants, was a maid servant by the name of Hagar that would later on permanently break Abram's heart. Hagar was the one that later on he would have relations with. He would have intimacy with on the advice of his wife, Sarah. Sarah was barren. Take Hagar, this this servant girl, and have relations with her. And we'll count that as our kid. And you know the story. Hagar conceived and Ishmael, Abram's firstborn. Ishmael was born. But the day came when As Ishmael was growing up, Sarah said, she has got to go, and so does Ishmael. And God said, listen to her. Listen to her. Send them away. And Abram cries out, oh, God, he says. His heart is broken. His oldest boy is sent away into the desert. And Abram's heart is broken, and he will permanently bear that burden all the days of his life. So wives, take hope. If hubby is not going the right way and you say, I'm going to be submitted to him, God's going to protect you, prosper the family, and if hubby's doing something wrong that he ought not to be, guess what? He is going to be pained. Because, you see, be sure your sins will find you out. It's so true. That those sins, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So it, it, you got to see, gals, well, man, the guy gets off scot-free. Not true. If I blow it in the leading of my family, there are going to be heartbreaks and heartaches for me without question. But if Tammy chooses to be in subjection to me when I'm not going perhaps the way I ought to be, listen, at that point, God's going to protect her and prosper our family in other ways, and I am still going to have to go through the pain and repercussions of my own sin. God's going to deal with me. If you, as a wife, 
are not into submission or subjection. If you say, I'm just not into that. Listen. Don't even think about being involved in some other ministry. Don't even think about starting a woman's Bible study, prayer meeting. Don't even think about being an evangelist. Don't even, don't even go there. It all begins at home. If it doesn't work at home, gals, it doesn't work. If it doesn't work at home, brothers, it doesn't work. God is so serious about this. He says, look, concerning leaders in ministry, if they can't raise their own kids in a godly way, how can they then raise God's children in discipling, in serving, in teaching, in ministry? And God says through the Apostle Paul that an elder, a leader, a brother must be one who is raising up his own family. If he's not doing that, he's disqualified from ministry. And if a woman is not submitted to her husband, even if she may not agree with him, if she's not submitted to him, then she's missing it. She has no business, in my opinion, pursuing any other ministry. If it doesn't work at home, it just doesn't work. Period. How serious is God about this? Ask Moses. God called Moses to lead the people out of Egypt to the promised land. But on the way, chapter 4 of Exodus, God comes and pins Moses to the ground. God called Moses to a very significant ministry, but wait. Moses didn't even take the time to do what he was supposed to do with his own son, with his own family. Gershom, his son, should have been circumcised years ago. But Moses neglected his own son. And if you neglect your own son, God says, that's deadly serious. If you can't tend your own son, if you can't take care of your own family, your ministry is dead, Moses. You're going to die right here. Zipporah understood that. She grabs the knife and she does what Moses should have done. By the way, wife, in that there's a story. If your husband doesn't choose to bring the Lord into the house, if he won't have family devotions or prayer time or or whatever it might be, if he just refuses to do it, you have the right to grab the knife, to grab the sword. It shouldn't have to be that way, but sometimes out of necessity it is. God is serious about this. Ask Moses. Ask Paul and Timothy. Ask Abram. It's got to be right at home with the kids in the marriage. If you're calling your husband, oh man, that old geezer. Or, well, you know, that that, that idiot. I'm not going to submit to him. He's always going the wrong way and he doesn't get it. And I've got a headache and I'm not going to submit to him. No way. If you've got a headache and you're not submitted to your husband, and I think you understand the implication, then you have no business in ministry. Take some aspirin. Do what you're supposed to do. Deal with the issues. Love your man. Submit to him. It's so important. And I guess my concern is simply this tonight, that I see sometimes men who are saying, I'm going to serve God when their son isn't circumcised. That's not right. And I see women who say, well, my husband, he doesn't have a clue, and I don't have time for him, but I'm going to go in this women's ministry. That ought not to be. It's got to be real at home. That's the most important place of ministry is the home. The home, the home, the home. Wives, be like Sarah. Even if he's going in a direction that you don't understand or agree with, submit to the Lord in submitting to him. You're honoring the Lord as you say to your husband, I'm going to honor you and submit to you today. If he's wrong, God will protect you. God will prosper the family, and he'll pay the repercussions, believe you me. If you would like to have this complete teaching, you may order one from our website at johncorson.com. You may also call us toll-free at 888-544-4858 and ask for the teaching from today's date. 
Again, that ordering number is 888-544-4858. You will also find on our website a variety of Pastor John's books, teaching packets, MP3 CDs, and other Bible study resources. Again, the address of the website is johncorson.com. That's J-O-N-C-O-U-R-S-O-N dot com. Searchlight is a listener-supported ministry. We appreciate your prayers and support. May the Lord richly bless you.